In the middle of 2019, ferocious and catastrophic wildfires began to wreak havoc in northern Australia. By January 2020, the fires burned more than 42 million acres of land across the country. 3,000 homes were destroyed and 33 people perished. The massive forest fires, dubbed Australia's Black Summer, also killed or displaced 3 billion animals. At 10,000 feet, all you could see from north to south was just fire, right up into Queensland and as far as I could see south into New South Wales was just fires. Come on, bro! Jump in! Come on! Fire itself, I don't think in my wildest dreams I could have imagined how intense, how bold and powerful it was, how loud, how terrifying, how hot. How did it happen? Is climate change to blame for the unprecedented calamity? And more than one year on, has life returned to normal for the survivors who lost their homes and livelihood as a result of the disaster? This is Cobago, an old dairy farming village located in the southeastern part of New South Wales, Australia. With a population of around 800 people, this quaint little village is famed for its beautiful rolling hills and charming colonial style buildings. But that changed in the 2019 2020 summer. It was here that residents of this village woke up to a terrifying reality. Massive flames ripped through the entire town, turning Cobago into a symbol of one of Australia's deadliest bushfire seasons in history. I was prepared for the inferno. Uh, I always felt it could be an inferno, uh, and we got, a, you know, we got an inferno. Uh, probably the worst fire this country's ever seen. You had the roar of the fire, you have a great wall of flame, and then you'll have the eucalyptus will explode, and the fireball would just jump 500 metres or more at a time and just explode onto the ground, just like a giant bomb going off. On the outskirts of Cobago lies a tiny hamlet called Wandela. Richard Tarlington and his wife June were busy working on their farm. The family has been working on this land for more than 60 years. But now, they're among a handful of full-time dairy farmers who remain in the village. Both Richard and June had experienced all of Australia's extreme weather conditions, from droughts to floods and fires. But nothing like the monstrous flames that tore through their town on New Year's Eve just last year. Until today, the horrific encounter has remained etched on their minds. June's 84-year-old father was staying just 16 kilometers away when the fire began to engulf his town. So Dad was, didn't live here with us. He lives closer to town near the cemetery. And um, I got out of bed at that half past one that morning and rang Dad straight away and said, Dad, get up, this fire's bad. Get Bella, his little dog, and get out. And I tried ringing him three times, I couldn't get him. It turned out that June's father, Ross Rickson, was already in the midst of defending his home from the raging fires. The experienced timber cutter even managed to warn four other families living nearby about the danger that confronted them and went back to try to protect his home. But he lost his dog, Bella, in the process. He also suffered serious burn injuries to his face and hands and had to undergo surgery to replace the burnt skin. And they flew him to Concord Hospital in Sydney and they operated on him that night and done a skin graft on his face and his hands and um, yeah, he appeared to be as if he was going to stay with us but uh, the trauma I think was too much. 
June's father died of a heart attack 18 days later. According to the Bushfires Royal Commission, more than 400 deaths due to smoke exposure from the 2019 to 2020 fire season were recorded, and more than 3,000 people were admitted to hospitals for heart and lung issues. Ross Rickson was among those who suffered and died from the effects of the bushfires. I guess most people would not have done what he'd done truthfully. They would have been so busy trying to get themselves out of their own situation, which was pretty dire. So I think what he did was incredible. Uh, a man of his age to even have the foresight to think, I've oh, got to try and go and help them before I save this house of mine was... He realised the value of the human life was far greater than any piece of timber's house that you had. He was a, a true Aussie who looked after his fellow mates and that was his whole life, just working for people. And probably, I know Janice mentioned that if he was still alive today, he'd be absolutely shattered if he could see the bush. Even though he's a timber cutter and worked in the bush all his life, he cared for it and he's well aware of the, the regrowth and the erosion and the whole environment and the animals that live there. He was a very in, in tune with all of that. And if he was able to see the utter destruction of that, that forest and what it is today, he'd it's probably better that he's not here. But their ordeal had only just begun. The raging fire had forced them to take a decisive action. In the early hours of December 31st, 2019, Richard and June decided to send their daughter and her one-year-old son to Cobago as a precautionary measure to help ensure their safety. The son-in-law, James, stayed behind with them to protect the 600-acre property from the flames, which continued relentlessly. The heat was in the air at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, we packed our daughter up and our little grandson, and she left. By now it's 3.30 because you, you're pacing around and you're getting sprinklers and pumps going and packing the car and, and, and trying to convince your daughter that the best place for her is not here with that little child. Um, so we were prepared as best we could. We knew that. We knew we'd done everything we could. But back on their property, the Tarlingtons got separated. Richard remained to defend the family home, while June and her son-in-law James went to the dairy farm about a kilometre away. I stayed here on my own, and June and son-in-law James were at the dairy in the main house defending down there. There was just the three able-bodied people here and during the fire, during the chaos of it all, the neighbour from the neighbouring property showed up on his tractor and he was badly injured with an ember in his eye. He was in great pain and I was trying to um, tend to him as best I could but he, he refused to go inside. He lay down on the veranda with a wet towel on his, on his face and I was stepping over the top of him, dragging water hoses, and yeah, that's all we could do. By now, our eyes are just streaming. We couldn't see what we were doing. We were in pain because they were just hurting so bad from the flame, from the heat, and this big windstorm come. I think they called it some cumulus thing, and uh, so it was like thunder above the dairy, and it was turbulating the wind, dropping big droplets of rain, and. Uh, we thought we were done. So we ran into the dairy and uh, James, who's pretty stoic, he said, uh, I, think we're, I think we're gonna die. The three of them fought the fires continuously from 4 a.m. till about 9 p.m. That's 17 straight hours. Finally, they succeeded. About 30 kilometers away, Ewan Thompson, Captain of Beloa Rural Fire Service Brigade was also at the scene, fighting fires on New Year's Eve together with his crew. In his 50 years' experience as a firefighter, he had never seen anything like it. It was the worst he had ever encountered. 
the black summer fires is something we haven't seen before. Uh, I have heard of reports in the 1890s and early 1900s of really bad fires on the coast, but of course they didn't have resources then to defend the, the, the areas like we had now. And I think we were complacent in a, a lot of ways that we never thought that the fire could be so widespread over hundreds and hundreds of kilometres. And that's something that's never happened down here before. So it really stretched resources to their limit. In the midst of battling the worst bushfire in his lifetime, Ewan lost a colleague, Colin Burns. He was among the first to join the brigade when it was newly formed in the 1950s. I had some of the members asked if they could be released to go back to defend their properties. And, uh, but Col was there and, and he, he, the reason he perished was the fact that he was trying to get back here to help us. If he'd stayed at his property or stopped on the way, he wouldn't have perished. But his, he felt it was his duty to get back here to help the rest of the valley. Anyway, the fire came in at an angle, caught him on a bend in the road. He couldn't see the road and he was just overwhelmed with the fire very quickly and just ran off the road and uh, couldn't get out. There was nowhere to go. Well, we didn't know for a fair while and then I asked a neighbour, uh, had anyone seen coal? This was the next morning on the 31st of December and they said, oh no, he perished in his vehicle. They found his body or the remains of his vehicle and uh, we were very upset, naturally, you know. Mike Sutton is from the Forestry Corporation of New South Wales, which manages 2.2 million hectares of state forests across the state. He says more than 40% of the state's native forest resource and 25% of its plantation resource were burned to the ground. In spite of mobilising all the necessary resources he could get to put out the fire, they found themselves spread far too thin due to the scale of the disaster. In 2019-20, not only did the fires on the north coast start much earlier, around August, uh, but they uh, were burning across many areas at the same time, so that really limited our capacity in Forestry Corporation to move our, our crews around. The Rural Fire Service has a, a very large volunteer base that that's, um, is, is local for a local area, but you know, also have the opportunity to, to move to support firefighting activities in other areas. But when, when the fires are as, as large and extensive as they were in Black Summer, then that becomes very difficult. So resources tend to get limited at a particular area. Economists estimate that the Australian bushfires of 2019 and 2020 may cost more than 100 billion Australian dollars in property damage and economic losses. That makes it the costliest natural disaster to date. But why were last year's forest fires in Australia so catastrophic? Is climate change to blame for the disaster? And will the seasonal bushfires get a lot worse from now on? The bushfire season, dubbed Black Summer, started in Queensland in July 2019. The blaze then spread quickly all the way down the coast, leaving behind a trail of destruction in its wake. More than 3,000 homes were destroyed in the process and at least 33 people were killed. Liam Dwizinik was among those who almost lost his home. Liam has been living here in the Blue Mountains all his life. His current home is in Dargan, a small town just a few hours' drive from Sydney. 
Although Australia experiences bushfires almost every summer, nothing could have prepared him for what he saw that day as the fire began to spread rapidly. He was then with his childhood friend, Jack. And we could see about a kilometre away, you could see a house had exploded and hearing the gas bottles, the LPG bottles exploding and watching that flame before it started coming up the hill to us was certainly a scary moment um, and knowing that that's what was then coming for us and not far away at all. Get the dogs! Get Liam the dogs! then brought all his livestock back into the enclosures, hoping that would help put them out of harm's way. But the fire came unexpectedly and in all directions. And before he could release his animals, the fire got to them. He could still remember the horrific sounds they made in the last moments. You see the flames coming up uh, well over the trees, six stories high. They were, like, as I looked about, there was no one else in the yard. Both the, the pigs, chickens and ducks all were within the fire before it even got close to us were nearly all dead at that point um, from just radiant heat, um, which was horrible to hear and see and, and something that we never thought would, would get to us like it did. Um, otherwise, we would have done things, you know, moved, like, taken everything away, but not knowing what was coming for us was another, another thing. The reality is, the writing was already on the wall about the impending disaster. Among others, the prolonged drought and record-breaking temperatures. Many believe it was a calamity that was waiting to happen, and it's all linked to climate change. These fires came at the end of the hottest and driest period we've ever known. It's been clear for decades, scientists have been warning for decades, that with climate change, we'll be entering a new period of megafires, that we'd be looking at ever more dangerous uh, fire conditions, increasing threats to Australian communities, to species and to ecosystems. Climate change is unequivocally increasing the fire danger in Australia. These fires came at the end of the hottest year we've ever experienced. The conditions were extremely dry. And the fires, once they started, were almost impossible to control. The former fire chief of New South Wales said that in his 50 or so years of fighting fires, he'd never seen conditions like that. He described seeing kangaroos unable to outrun fires, uh, previously very rare uh, um, phenomena like fire tornadoes, what we call pyroconvective storms where fires are so big they start spawning other storms with dry lightning strikes. We were seeing this repeatedly. It really was an unprecedented fire season. 2019 was indeed the hottest and driest year ever recorded in Australia. The country also broke its all-time temperature record twice in December the same year. An average maximum of 40.9 degrees Celsius was recorded on December 17th. A day later, it hit another record at 41.9 degrees Celsius. A veteran firefighter, Craig Burley, believes that nothing could have prevented the bushfires from taking place, given the circumstances. It was the Black Summer fires were an experience that I'd never gone through before. The season started very early in the far north coast in August, where we started getting very big fires, and then progressed south to Gosses Mountain fire starting on October the 26th and then the fire season just kept progressing further to the south into the south coast area where we were still getting fires in, in February and March. So I don't think those fires could have been prevented. The conditions, the climatic conditions that we were facing were such that any ignition was going to take and put significant fire on the ground. So could they have been prevented? I don't believe so. The Bushfire Royal Commission report acknowledged that climate change had fueled the black summer bushfire season. And it will be more intense and continue to increase its frequency over the years if nothing is done to address the problem. Head of Research at the Climate Council, Dr Simon Bradshaw, believes stronger action is needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to help tackle the problem at its source. 
Scientists have been warning us for decades that if we don't rein in our emissions, if we don't move beyond coal, oil and gas, then we're going to be looking at far more dangerous fire weather. And we've entered that period of consequences where we have now locked in a lot of these impacts and we are looking at a more dangerous future. We largely squandered the uh, critical last decade during which we had to be rating in emissions as fast as we can. That said, there is so much more we can and must do to be avoiding still worse devastation in future. It's essential that emissions plummet this decade and every action we take now is gonna be measured in avoiding worse devastation down the line. The irony is, Australia is the world's second largest coal exporter. It shipped almost 400 million tonnes of coal out of the country in 2019. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison has so far refused to commit to net zero emissions target by 2050 in support of politically sensitive industries like coal and gas. Australian Greens leader and federal MP for Melbourne, Adam Band, feels that the current government's energy policy, as well as its inadequate response against climate change, are going to make the incidence of bushfires even more severe in the future. From the moment that this government came to power, it repealed the carbon price in Australia, which uh, was bringing down pollution, and then it um, started putting public money into expanding coal and gas and hampering the growth of renewables and pollution went up. Now that is, is not negligent, it's close to a climate crime. Um, when you've got a report after report sitting on your desk saying that one of the most important things you could do to protect Australia and minimise the risk of severe bushfires happening is to cut pollution, and then you do the opposite, well, that, in my mind, makes the government culpable. But what more can the government do to put an end to the devastating bushfires in the future? Will the fires stop burning? More than a year has passed since Australia suffered its worst bushfires in decades. The massive fires had turned large swaths of lush natural forests into barren land. Walls of burned trees remain visible in many parts of the ravaged regions of the country, with naked branches reaching out into the sky, all brittle and bare. Australia experiences bushfires almost every summer each time that happens, the damage caused to property and the environment is unimaginable. The loss of human and animal life is equally staggering. The event of 2019 and 2020, for example, was unprecedented in terms of its severity and scale. This uh, fire was so widespread, so we had it coming from all directions. It, there was no area where you could say if we defend that area we could we might be able to stop it. This came on so many fronts that it made it impossible to defend it. Even if we'd had 10 or 15 units here I doubt if we could have uh, stopped it because it was just bursting out. It's like um, overweight person bursting out at the seams. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it was just suddenly starting spot fires all over the area. So, debate has been raging on how best to prevent a similar calamity from happening again. One solution which has been offered to prevent fires from spreading is to accelerate the process of what's known as hazard reduction or controlled burning. This method involves a deliberate effort of starting fires under controlled conditions. The idea is to clear out flammable materials on the ground of bushland, forest and grasslands, which is among the main culprit behind the increasing spread of wildfire. From a preparation point of view, the Royal Commission's inquiries have all recommended uh, increasing the amount of fuel reduction 
whether that's hazard reduction burning or using other techniques. There's a limited window where that can be done safely, but the more fuel management that can be done, particularly around valuable assets, uh, that will help from a fire suppression point of view. Mike Sutton is the Manager of Innovation and Research at Forestry Corporation in New South Wales. He's been working with the forestry and fire industry for almost 30 years. Even though the hazard reduction method may be useful in controlling the spread of the bushfire, it has its own set of limitations. Mike feels that early detection of forest fires is key to resolving the problem of bushfires. I think in terms of, of getting ready or being aware, the earlier we can detect a fire, the more chance we've got of putting it out. So that's where the technology will really assist. If, as, as that improves and we get better at detecting fires earlier, and we can have the resources to deploy to, to the fires, then uh, we'll be in our best position to deal with them. In recent years, a new technology has also been used to replicate the difficult and dangerous conditions that firefighters must face when training to fight fires. It's meant to equip firefighters with the right skills to help minimize injuries and fatalities. And it's done through a customized and immersive virtual reality setup. That's what James Mullins, founder of Flame Systems, is offering. I guess one of the challenges we see with traditional training is that we have to go to hot fire training grounds, we have to burn materials, we're exposed to carcinogens. So the flame technology was really developed to enable the training to come to the firefighter. We can put firefighters in all manner of experiences that they may or may not ever see in their career. Uh, we allow them to make mistakes, we allow them to experience what those kinds and types of fires are and we allow them to learn from them. Mick Abramson, who's a second lieutenant of the Grovedale Volunteer Fire Brigade in Victoria, has been training with VR for the past three years. He feels that the VR training gives him more opportunity to train and develop the necessary skills he needs to fight fires in real life and in hazardous situations. Under traditional training, our, our restrictions have been getting the right number of people around the right weather conditions, be it the wind, be it the temperature, wind strength, uh, and, and having the right location to do training. With the immersive, you don't have to have any of that. You don't have to have a minimum number. Your minimum per people are one. Whoever wants to go and do it. Who wants, whoever wants to be involved. And then the weather and the wind side of things doesn't come into it because you can be inside a shed uh, or you can be outside, it doesn't matter, in a tent, it doesn't matter. You can do it anytime, any place, anywhere. The feedback you get through the, the, the pack on, on your shoulders, the, the kickback from the hose when you shoot, when you shoot the water, it, you get the kickback. If the fire heats up, you get heated up. You, you actually feel it in, in real time. It, there's no lag, it's, it's, yeah, you, it's not something that I haven't felt outside of being in a hot fire environment. Firefighters are also using satellites, artificial intelligence, drones and cloud computing to fight bushfires more intelligently and efficiently. Mike Sutton's team at the Forestry Corporation has also developed a mobile mapping application called Map App to synchronise and share data on the ground. I also manage uh, our, a fleet of 50 drones in Forestry Corporation. So they can be used for uh, fire detection and some of those drones have a thermal capacity which means that we can identify hot spots uh, on the ground that might not actually be visible either from the ground or from the air. Uh, and very important for determining how fires are advancing and where the active fire edge is. And recently uh, I've also been uh, investigating the use of technology to assist with early fire detection. So the, the, the overall goal with fire suppression is to find the fire as early as possible when it's small so that it's easier to, to put out. 
the objective of those, or the three really, the drones and the satellite detection and the camera detection is to get us that early advice about where fires are when they start or soon after they start so that we can we can get to them quickly and get them out before they become big and problematic. With the increasingly unpredictable and extreme weather conditions, can technology be relied upon to fight the ferocious bushfires in Australia? And more than a year after the massive bushfires, has a sense of normality returned to the region worst affected by the disaster? This is what's left of Wendella Hall following the 2019 bushfire that ravaged the town of Cobago in southeastern New South Wales. The fire also consumed 400 homes and burned some 315,000 hectares of land in the area. The community hall was once a focal point for Wendella residents. Today, is just a pale shadow of its former self. Well, the Wandela Hall is part of our community, has been for a very long time. Um, it's a little hall that just holds significance because in the world of change, it's something that's remained historically sound and stayed and always there. It's always been a point of reference for people to know, well, they've reached the locality of Wandella because there's the Wandella Hall. It's used for many local functions. In past, we've had weddings there, wedding services, wedding receptions, um, lots of parties. It used to be a really thriving little hubbub of a hall. It, it was a shock to see it actually gone. But since the bushfires ravaged this town more than a year ago, the once devastated region appears to have come back to life once again. Trees have begun to flourish, with fresh growth emerging from their blackened trunks and branches in the region, known for its idyllic landscape and rolling hills. Still, traumatic memories are hard to forget. The event of late 2019 has left deep emotional scars in the community especially those who had lost their friends and loved ones in the disaster. Friends of mine and farmer, a good old friend of mine, every, everybody loved Ross Rickson. He was an old woodcutter. Um, yeah, lovely, lovely man uh, in his 80s. And he, he actually got up and went and warned all his neighbours that the fire was coming. A lot of people were asleep. They had no idea. I know a couple of people who died, three people actually, who died of heart attacks in the weeks and months afterwards, who lost every, they, they lost everything, basically. David is a retired dairy hand. Until today, the catastrophic event has left him traumatised. He's often reminded of the terrifying moment when he had to save his house amid a wall of fire that came from all directions, putting his life under extreme danger. I still don't sleep well. I still, yeah, I still don't sleep well. I, I go to sleep all right, and then in the middle of the night, I just wake up, and that's what happened in the night of the fire. I'd gone to sleep, and I woke up, and, and it was just like and that, yeah. I, apparently, it takes about two years to get for, to get your normal, come back, get that stress. And I did. I had post-traumatic stress. I was completely afterwards. I just, yeah. It was just so traumatic. It's so traumatic to be in that fire. And here, I was trying to save the buildings. I was out, it, all this was on fire, like you're out in it. And I was on my own, which makes it kind of, yeah, it, it was, uh, yeah, it makes you really appreciate what it, it's like for first responders, police, military, whatever, firemen who are in that situation all the time. It, it's incredibly, it's, yeah, incredibly stressful. Although he managed to save his house in the end, the incident has left a huge psychological impact on him, as well as on the larger community living in the area. I think everybody's been affected by it. I think that 
it has it something's changed whether it's out in the open or but I think in inside it has changed uh, and I, I people and you're not going to forget an experience like that and people are still rebuilding like you know almost 10 months 15 months whatever it is now people are still waiting to rebuild although a lot of rebuilding is happening and but I think there's a, that underlying sense of there's a trauma a major trauma happened and that, that takes a long time for people to if ever you know get it out of the system like I will never forget that day it was one of those things that it will till I you know the day I die that night I'll never forget like it's just something that's deeply it's probably one of the most frightening things I've ever had to do certainly in my life you know and and yeah, certainly um, probably the most one of the most traumatic as well Tom Watton for one has blamed the government for not acting fast and caused the fire to spin out of control. When he was warned about the oncoming fire, the 68-year-old quickly packed up his belongings to save his family from imminent danger. He left the house that he had built over the years from ground up with his wife Sharon and their six children. Well, the Australian government, if they got their act together early enough, like I said before about the bombing there, they used to firebomb every year, I mean, eight years ago they've stopped doing it. But if they kept that going, so they used to bomb all around the hills here, like controlled burning, and they stopped it for money. They no funds, which they reckon, I don't know where, they, where that comes from, but that would have that been a good 80% of the fires would have not have happened. Me being living here on my for 25 years, you can read between the signs, like, you know, because you just see the undergrowth getting thicker and thicker and thicker, and just went bushka, max of a tin of petrol. Me and Sharon were living here when the fires happened. There was oh, we had only two of us. When the fires come, we want to touch about the fires when it come over the hill and stuff. Or, yep. Well, we left. The fire was coming over the top of that ridge there. And we had to leave. Otherwise, we'd have been cooked. So we all went to Cobargo. Then we went to Boomagui. Then they sent us to Naruma. Then they sent us to Canberra, which is a fair, fair travel. Then we come back. I come back here about a month after the fires to live here again because I couldn't stand being in the town any longer. I wanted to be back in the bush, which is uh, where I like it here. Anyway, but it was all black. It was all you can imagine. You imagine them trees still smouldering. Many of the survivors who lost their property to the fire are now facing a long wait to rebuild their homes all over again. A year after the bushfire that killed 33 Australians, many victims are still struggling to have a proper place to live in. Some are still staying in temporary homes. Others, like Tom Watton, are living in sheds or caravans on their fire-ravaged properties. Several aid groups have banded together to help people like him to tide over the difficult period. In Cabargo, the relief centre's still going. It's a little one in the main street where people donate stuff and they give it to the people likes of, likes of us or other people need it. Yeah, Woolies and Coles, the major supermarkets, they've been donating fruit and vegetables and you know, like, instead of throwing it all away, they've been donated to, to people to take it around the towns and drop it off to people here. Yeah. And that other mob that deliver food to your door, f fresh or something it's called, They've been donating boxes of food, plus meat, like food packages, to the relief centre in Cabago there, which has been good. The Insurance Council of Australia, or ICA, said insurers have received 38,000 claims related to the Black Summer fires. The payouts could amount to around $2.3 billion in total. But until today, rebuilding efforts are far from complete. There's a few things underway. We have a, a Cabaga Cooperative has been approached by the, the BCA, the Business Council of Australia, who run a trust, and they have offered to build us a business hub, which is like six small shops put together. So that project has been in play for some time now. It's had a few hold-ups, but a new company in Australia called Formflow are the ones that designed the building and, and are offering the building at a reduced cost to, to put it there. 
But the project itself is, we believe, almost reaching the culmination point of being finally started and being rebuilt. And into there, we hope to be able to put some of the fire affected business holders that were deeply impacted because they lost all their stock, uh, their building, their outlet to be able to sell. There is play underway to try to build a big resilience centre down at the showground. Uh, will be a multi-purpose building that will hopefully be there if we ever have, God forbid, another tragedy like this fire come through. Then it should be a place that people can culminate and support and stay safe because there weren't a lot of places you felt safe. In spite of progress being made in the rebuilding efforts, the threat of future fires hangs heavily over their heads. There are still concerns that severe fires could happen again unless further measures are taken to address the root cause. Leader for the Australian Greens and Federal MP of Melbourne, Adam Bant, says Australia cannot afford another black summer and calls on the federal government to tackle the problem of climate change now, before it's too late. My fear is that there will be another black summer and my real fear is that we look back on 2019, 2020, 2021 as a period of stable weather. Um, things potentially could get worse and could get a lot worse. And we're on notice here in Australia. We've been told that unless we get the climate crisis under control, then we're going to have 92% decline in our major agricultural basin, the Murray-Darling, which will mean by the end of the century we won't be able to feed ourselves. And we've been told that these fires that we've seen uh, aren't going to happen one in every 50 years or one in every 20 years anymore. They're going to start happening every few years. So we could not only see a repeat of it, but we could see it coming more often. But speaking at a global climate summit in April 2021, Prime Minister Scott Morrison resisted pressure to set more ambitious carbon emission targets even as other major nations vowed deeper reductions to tackle climate change. Well, the policies must start with a very firm commitment to steep emissions reductions this decade. We're saying we should uh, reduce our emissions by 75% by 2030. Then it's how do you get there? And that's where we need very clear, practical measures, where we're not developing any new coal, oil and gas, and we're having a managed phase out of fossil fuels to renewable energy in ways that support workers, in ways that ensure nobody is left behind, in ways that's setting up Australia for a bright and prosperous future. Now we're lucky as Australia, we've got everything we need to do that. We've got all those resources, we've got the skills, we've got the community will for this to happen. It's just having that uh, leadership from our national government to unleash that potential. The sheer scale of the bushfires that scarred so much of Australia's east coast more than a year ago shocked millions of people around the world. It's one of the countries most vulnerable to rising temperatures. Extreme weather conditions have already cost the Australian economy more than $35 billion over the past decade. And many Australians are now concerned that the cost of climate inaction could be even more deadly. My fear is that Cabago will struggle, will reach a point where we all reach exhaustion point of trying to rebuild and we can't get our little town back up to what it was. My fear is other lives will be lost if we have another fire like this, because they will, because you can't stop it. You've just got to prepare and try and make the situation as safe as possible and with a lot of luck, you manage to get through. We're at a stage now where we've entered a new period of much more dangerous fire conditions. We have to prepare for that reality. Australia is a big emitter however we look at it. We emit more than 180 other countries. And if you uh, look at the amount of emissions embodied in the coal and gas that we export, that makes us around the, the fifth biggest source of carbon pollution globally. So we're a huge part of the problem. There's no economic or technical barriers. It's simply been an absence of leadership at the national level. It's achievable, it's doable, and yes, of course, we will get there. <laughs>